and welcome to The Shift, the podcast that aims to tell the no holds barred truth about being a woman post 40. Created and hosted by me, writer and broadcaster, Sam Baker. Now, regular listeners have probably noticed that I'm trying a few different things with this series. I wanted to hear more women's voices with more varied experiences. And today's guest is definitely one of those. I first met Karen McCluskey 12 years ago when I was editor of Red Magazine, and we gave her a Woman of the Year award for her role in reducing gang violence by 50% in Glasgow, formerly known as the murder capital of Europe. In large part, thanks to Karen, Glasgow became one of the safest cities in the UK. Karen has been advocating for a more enlightened and empathetic approach to violent crime for most of her career. She became a nurse at 17 before training as a forensic psychologist and then joined the police where she has worked extremely successfully to bring a public health approach to violence reduction. All this while being a single parent. I've got a picture where I think there was around 50 of us on the sort of senior CID and I think one or two women. I mean, constantly just in rooms with me and I never really thought anything of it. I met Karen at her office off a busy road on the outskirts of Edinburgh, as you'll hear, where she is now Chief Executive of Community Justice Scotland, to talk about constantly being the only woman in the room, breastfeeding in the police car park, and how she's managed to avoid vicarious trauma. We also discussed why she was slightly terrified of the menopause, but not of Glasgow knife gangs, why parenting is just an exercise in guilt, high heels, HRT, and why her mantra is feel bad, move on. Content warning, there is discussion of violence, sexual abuse and domestic violence in this episode. So Karen, really welcome to The Shift. It's so nice to see you again. And I'm actually really, really, really pleased that you re- even remember who I was. Oh, no, absolutely. I'm delighted. How mortifying was winning a Red Woman of the Year award? Well, I never read it because <laughs> it was lovely going down and I took my daughter because, you know, I'd been a single parent and she'd missed out a lot on me, you know. And so it was, you know, because I'd done stuff at night and whatever. So it was lovely to go down and do it and really unusual but I don't read stuff that I'm in because I just can't. It makes me, you know, it makes me question myself and I can't I have to just put it to the side once I've done it and move on. But it is lovely. And I've still got a cup that someone made for me. A oh, really? red hot woman. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, is that not, not reading, not listening to anything that you've done? Is that something that started since social media? Have you always done it? No, I've always done it. So when I was in, when I was in the police, and particularly when I was doing violence reduction, when we started the violence reduction down in 2002, 2003, and I was with my colleague, John. Do you know, people... I've heard of us for ages, you know, it was just those idiots who were going to try something different. And then, I don't know, something shifted. We started getting a lot of success. We were working really hard. I mean, just all hours. And then people started to get interested in what we're doing because we were doing stuff that was very different and people started to write things. And, of course, when people start to write stuff positive, I don't know, there's this opposing moral universe that has to write something negative about you. yeah. And I think I read a few things and it made me really self-critical. And particularly mm. in that because they were commenting on what you look like and, you know, all the other things that come along with yeah, if being you're a, a woman. woman. Yeah. I mean, they weren't caring about the fact that, you know, my colleague didn't have makeup on or was looking a bit ropey in a photograph. I mean, we all have ropey photographs. And I just thought, I'm not going to do this anymore. And I, I, I mean, literally, that's from 2004. Just never did it. I don't look at what's written about me on Twitter. I never read newspaper articles that I've done. I never listen to myself because I just feel that I've got this thing around feel bad and move on. You know, I can't change Mm. it. So therefore, why would I focus on it? I recommend everybody to do it. (laughs) Yeah, I really like that. So that was that feel bad and then move on. Absolutely, because... I can say so. I will say things during this podcast that I think oh, I wish I hadn't said that. But I'm an <laughs> oh, I hope so. I'm an overshooter, <laughs> and I can't take it back. You know, it's just who I am. I'd probably say it to friends, and so I would say it on here. 
It's interesting, isn't it? Because it's like I want, did once have a boss said, who said to me, worry about the next thing, not the last thing. And that's, do you know, it's a great message to live by mm. uh, because we live our lives in guilt and shame. And I mean, it's a very Scottish Calvinist thing, isn't it? You know, yeah. We are imbued with it. You know? yeah. you and know. a very female thing. So you've got it twice. Oh, you've got it twice. Yeah, it's <laughs> Scottish and female. You know? yeah. it's, and it is it is just, you know, it's, it's a really toxic thing. And I wish I'd found it earlier on when I was younger. And then. Oh, God. You know. Yeah. So I want to talk to you some more about being a woman in the environment that you work in. But before we do that, let's go right back to your childhood mm-hmm. mom. so do you mind me asking how old are you are you mid 50 so i am 58 oh you're probably like six months older than me um so you grew up in Falkirk, is that so right? i grew up in a little pit village in reading which is just outside Falkirk, um with three sisters two i've got two other sisters there's three of us three girls mm-hmm. and my dad who originally was a laborer and then went to night school and got his, I mean, I remember this, went to night school and went to Stirling University and did a degree in biology. So, How old were you when you did that? So I was I was nine when he graduated. So I remember going to his graduation and, wow. you know, and he was the first sort of in his family and my dad loved education. And, and I think for us, it was a big thing, you know, he always made us think, you know, education is really important, going to school is really important, you know, and he'd... I don't know, he sort of set that tone for us. I think it's probably pretty evident, my sisters and I. Yes, it's your, I mean, you're insanely successful, but your sisters are too, aren't they? What do so, they do? So my sister's um, an airline pilot, but she tre- she teaches, she's in the States, and she teaches all the commercial airline pilots. So she is a flight school, so she trains all the commercial pilots and the people who do in search and rescue. And so she does that. And wow. my other sister's um, uh, as a research scientist. So he has, he really imbued that sort of love of education, love of reading. I mean, I love libraries. It's my big thing, you know. I, the smell of the paper, just the sitting in libraries, he would take us to go and choose books. I mean, I, I mean, he probably owned the national debt of a small country with unpaid fines. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's I really remember that, you know. It's, I used to take my daughter to libraries and I sort of I hate the fact that they're closing down now. Yeah, it's really, somebody said to me a couple of weeks ago, and I was so shocked, I think my mouth, I have got an expressive face anyway, and I think my mouth literally dropped open. Somebody said, well, what's the point of libraries anyway? And I I mean, even just saying it to you is like my mouth's dropped open. Because it's like, I'm sorry, there speaks somebody, there speaks the voice of privilege. Absolutely. And just, it's the feeling, the touch of the books, and I quite like the quiet in the libraries. If you think of life now, it's not quiet. I mean, I would have libraries with, you could get some coffee and you'd some soft seats that people can sit and you can just peruse the books. You know that, to touch them and to, you know, to flick through mm. them. I mean, maybe people do that in water stones now, but yeah. I, I just think there is something really nice about libraries. And actually, it's a time out we need. Yeah. To waste a morning or an afternoon in a library is a life well, you know, lived, I think. And it's without all the psychic noise as well of social media, isn't it? That's the thing. I would have one of these, I would have one of these things that sort of block mobile phone signal. Take it off, people say, put it in there, you yeah. know, so that people aren't distracted because people are so distracted. So we never pay attention to anything for any length of time. And I think it's, you know, I always say to my daughter who rolls her eyes, of course, you know, it's like the death of humanity. That we mm. can't speak to each other. Because we're born connected and we need to be able to speak to each other, have conversations and, I don't know, yeah, you know, appreciate each other, you know, or or disagree with each other and work out how we disagree well. But we're both that generation who grew up sitting on the stairs with the phone, pulling the cord as far as we could away from the living room door so our parents couldn't hear our conversation um, with our mates. If we had them, I didn't have many. Gen- How old's your daughter in her 20s? She's 23 now. So yeah. she's that generation where that just, what are you talking about? Oh, I mean, I had to explain to her what a party line was. <laughs> and she nearly wet herself laughing. She was like, what, you shared a telephone line with somebody else? I said, yeah, I used to lift up the phone. You could hear them on the phone. You put it back down again. Yeah. I said, it's, um, I mean, it is just bonkers how quickly life has changed and, 
I mean, she's got no lens in which to, I mean, she's looking through a tele, you know, a, a telescope the opposite way around, and it's so far away. She's like, yeah. You know, I mean, it, it feels like 1915 to her. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Well, it's last century, isn't it? And then some. So were you a swatty kid? No, God, no, I was terrible. I was terrible. I I was really poor at school. I was really interesting. I, I sort of reflect now. I didn't do that great at school. And I I felt the pressure to be better at school, but I just was not mature. Do you know, I found my mojo Where much are you and on. your sister's? So my sister is 11 months younger than me, Catholics. Yes. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then... Irish twins. Irish right? twins. And then my other sister is six years younger than me. So, All right, so you're the eldest. So I'm the eldest. And I was quite sporty, did a lot of swimming, always loved being out and about. And I just wasn't mature, you know. I look back in it now and I think, I mean, I was much better when I got into my twenties. I was much more disciplined. Could sit down and read. Was more interested. But you know, it's just one of these things, isn't it? I, I go into schools all the time because I love going to schools because a they are all taller than me now. I mean, how do girls get to be so tall? I'm five foot four. It's that big, aren't they? <laughs> they are huge, and and I'm always so impressed with them because they're all they're so they're amazing. I hate when people speak to me about about young people and, you know, because I meet them all the time. And so I don't know, and, you know, people are telling me, oh, you need to know what you're doing. Well, no, you don't. And I didn't find out what I wanted to do until probably I was mid-twenties. No, you said you didn't get your mojo till, till you were older and I rudely talked over you. When did you, when, that was that when you got it or were you older still? So no, I think, so I trained as a nurse. So my mum, I think I'd wanted to do gap year. My mum said, I think we live in a council house. We don't do gap years. No, um, I, I don't, don't come from a gap year family. And we don't come from a gap year family. And so she said, you should go and do nursing. I'd come from quite a, quite a lot of nurses in my family. And I did. I went at the age of 17 and a half and trained to be a nurse. And it's too young, really. You know, too young. But it has been the best thing I ever did. I mean, it really has. It gave me just an understanding of people. I think I grew up. I think I worked out what I really loved about life and about people, and I do love people. And so it just, that gave me a chance, and I've always used it. So it's one of these things I've always been able to go back to. You know, so I, and that's probably when I grew up and then, you know, went on to do, you know, trained in psychology. Back then, there weren't so many women in further education, were there? I mean, there you look at it now, girls are more than 50% at university, but... You know, the university I went to, you know, which wasn't particularly posh one. Was, I think we were like 16%. Yeah. So it was quite unusual. It is. Especially for kids from ordinary backgrounds. Yeah. And I think it's strange. I, I sort of, I did love it. I did love it. And I, you know, it sort of just gave me something. I think, oh, this is what it's like, you know. This is what it's like to be in a sort of university education and, you know, and a bit of privilege. And then having to go back and work in the emergency rooms you know, or mm. A&E as it was then called, like, you know, during summer and Easter and, you know, I occasionally doing weekends to try and work your way through it. So it was quite nice. It was a nice juxtaposition. Yeah, they stop you going off into that, into student land. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was, there was no... And, it, of course, I went to I went to university in Northern Ireland and it was during, during the Troubles. So right. so it was still, you know, it there was lots of other things going around. You know, mm. so it wasn't it wasn't a bubble. It certainly wasn't Cambridge. No, no. So how old were you when you qualified as forensic psychologist? So I then did a master's in investigative psychology at Liverpool. So in ninety four and ninety five. Fascinating. So it was so it was called the offender profiling course. So run by a guy called David Cantor, and he had you know so Rob Ressler and, and John Douglas from the FBI had been had been doing all this stuff in behavioural insights and behavioural you know, offender profiling. I know it's a hackneyed phrase. And then they'd set up this course, and there were six psychologists and six police officers who got on this course in the year, and I got on it. And I was really fascinated in how people operate in groups. That's my big thing. I love work because. What people do on their own and what people do in groups are often very difficult. You get a risky shift. You'll do something very different in a group. That's what you see in football, in football hooliganism. Mm. And, you know, I was interested in armed robbery teams. So I loved it. I mean, I suddenly found that I was a square peg in a square hole. You know, I just thought, 
I'm endlessly interested in. I'm endlessly interested in behaviour. Still to this day, I still get up and I think, oh, that is really fascinating. You know, I can keep myself constantly engaged in why did someone do that? How did they operate? And, you know, I've got lots of friends who are defence lawyers and tell, tell me about things that are happening and I think, oh, that is fascinating. Or I'll meet someone, you know, in prison and they'll tell me how they got there. And I don't know, there's just the narratives. As a journalist, you would know that yeah. you think, really? I mean, I hear the most bizarre things. I mean, you couldn't even write it. I mean, Val McDermott and Ian Rankin couldn't even imagine half the things that I've heard yeah. in prison. Well, if you wrote it, your editor would go, that's just not realistic. Oh, that is. Absolutely. <laughs> they would say, no, that is not real. I would say it absolutely is real. You know, and so it's, I mean, it's just, it's just interesting. It's just the human condition. And terrible things that people do. I mean, terrible things. But also, choices that they've made in their life that end up leading up to sometimes tragic circumstances. Right throughout your career, you've been exposed to like you say, terrible things. Yeah. But it hasn't, you can just tell from how fired up you get when you start talking about it. Has it, how has it not worn you down? I think if you speak to anybody who's been in this long enough, there are things that stay in your brain and they stay in mine. And there's cases, and I've got a particular case that I'll, I'll always go back to. And it's really interesting. I, th- I think we forget just how much people carry and if you've been doing it a long time. And I think particularly, uh, you know, there was a, a period of time when, when I, was, I went into the police, obviously, in 1995, where you're working on cases and something sometimes get to, and it may not just be about the case, it may be where you are. So I'd had, I'd had my, my daughter. In 1995. So, no, I had her in 2000, so it was later on. I had her in 2000. And I don't know, it just made me think of things differently. When you look at things like child abuse Mm. or some of the really terrible things that happen, it sort of shifts your perception. I am fundamentally someone who thinks innocent till proven guilty. There are cases out there where you just can't find the evidence and you may think this is a person who's done it, but it is really important that you find the evidence to prosecute someone because, God forbid, you should have a case like Andrew Malkinson. He spent all the... Well, he, spent, he was convicted of a rape and evidence was there. There was DNA. He didn't do it. He was. He spent a long time, a decade, I think over a decade in, in prison for a crime that he didn't commit and he's just been exonerated. And So it's really important you do things right. But I sometimes think the way that you think about things and particularly, you know, sexual abuse and, 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 and all the crimes that are around that, it just made me think a bit differently. So, yeah, I think you do you carry it. Part of it's about your own resilience. I've got lots of people that I who are in the same field that we speak to about things. Sometimes getting it out of your brain is the best way. It's like vicarious trauma. They always say if you speak about it really quickly with someone about something you've seen, it helps you process it. You know that intrusive thoughts that you get, you know, mm. that, that mull over, that wake you up in the middle of the night and you start to think about it. So trying to get it out there and speak it with somebody, you know, and obviously lots of it's in confidence, but speak about it with somebody you trust and doing that vice versa. I think that's not bad, even over half a lager or a glass of wine. Especially over... Especially <laughs> with a glass of wine. You'd been in the police five years when you had your daughter. I did. And were you always a single mum? I was a single mum until she was 13. So you joined the police and you worked mm-hmm. in West Mercia, didn't you? I Which was originally in like Sussex and then I went to West Mercia police. Yeah. How did you balance that, being a woman in still quite a male, arguably sexist, yeah. misogynist, homophobic <laughs> institution? Um, that's me saying that, not you. And being a single mum, how did that work? I have no idea. Honestly, I I look back now and I have no idea how I did it. It's, it's, I think I think the women all over think, oh, I know that feeling. So I'd, I'd had a lot of pregnancy complications and so had used up most of my maternity leave at the time I'd actually had my daughter. Oh my and God. so I went back when she was, I think, nine weeks old. And I remember my mum came down and stayed with me and brought her up to the <laughs> 
brought her into the police car park so I could breastfeed her in the car park. Oh, my God. And then I, I, I don't know, you just do it. You know, yeah. it, you just do it. And I think what I've realised now when I look back on it is that parenting is just an exercise in guilt. And see, when you, you accept that, it's all gravy. You feel guilty for being at home. You feel guilty for not being at work. I did spend a lot of time feeling really guilty. I went away on a, a missing body murder um, in another police force, and she must have been about 15 weeks old. Did you take her with you? Mm-mm. I couldn't. A missing no. body murder. No, I didn't I couldn't. see her. I was doing that. We were doing an investigation. So you leave her with your parents? So I left her with my parents. And I don't know why. I do say to women now, you should draw your line in your sand and not cross it. I think I crossed it, you know? Yeah. I was... But what was it? The 2000s, I mean, it's still, you felt you had different to. Different times, presumably. different times. And and you're sort of, I don't know, I mean, maybe it is different now, but you felt that you had to be good, if not better, mm. than your colleagues around you. I and I mean, it's don't, still like that. They were really supportive. I mean, do, I mean, they were really supportive. And uh, there was a, a, a chief super there who was, you know, a guy called Barry, who was, who was actually, he, he did a lot only within the confines of what you could do. And I think it would be different now. But, yeah, it was, a, it was a, an interesting time. And, you know, you're going on a missing body murder and it had to be a young woman. So it makes you think differently. You know, odd yeah. times, odd times. And then you just have to be out there. I mean, policing doesn't stop. And I worked, you know, I worked in intelligence analysis. So, you you know, you're working on heinous crimes. You're, you know, you're, you're setting up incident rooms. And you just have to be there. There's no, you know, you can't just say, well, I'm sorry, I, uh, I'm, I'm cocking off. And I do remember that when I worked, I moved later on to, to go up to Strathclyde Police. And there was a nursery across the road. And I do say this, and I'm sure some of my colleagues won't, won't like me saying this, but there was a nursery across the road that opened at eight o'clock. And every, they had the briefing, which was a briefing about what had gone on overnight, an intelligence briefing. And it started at eight. And I said, can you wait 10, 15 minutes? Move it forward a bit so I can get in. And they wouldn't do it. And it's strange. I had to walk in late every, every day. day. Every day. And it's just, it's like a small, it feels like a microaggression. And, you know, people went for but, breakfast afterwards. I mean, we always had a great breakfast. We'd have a breakfast first. And then, you know, yeah. but it, was a, it was a tradition that people did. And it didn't bend. And, you know, I don't blame them. It probably just didn't even think about it. Well, except that you did ask and they said no. Yeah, but I suppose, and I see, it's, you know, just, I'm, what I'm exp- oh, it's just what we do. It's just what we do. That's just how it is. You have to bend in, in, into that and we don't bend around you. And you can imagine the conversations, can't you? They're kind of, oh, you know, women, we want the, you know, they come in yeah. we're, and then we've got to change it to accommodate. Yeah. Absolutely, and, and I remember like somebody had said that one of the one of the managers hadn't realised I was a single parent, and when he found out, you could always see him gripping the desk. Thing. Oh, <laughs> no. But it is it's that it's that anxiety. That's the thing that I remember most is the anxiety. Like the nursery, I closed at six, and I remember like still being in a meeting and a briefing, and it was really important. And you know, and I felt I could feel. The anxiety, you know, that churning of your stomach, like, I need to go, but I feel embarrassed about having to leave. And exercising guilt. And what did you do? Did you leave? I had to leave. I mean, the nursery was going to close. You know, I had to leave. And then you feel guilty because your daughter's been there all day. So, yeah, not great times, really. I mean, she's incredibly resilient, you know, and robust. And I ask her about things now. I, I used to think, I mean, she loved the places that she was in. And I, I remember I had a childminder at one point and she loved her childminder. And I loved the fact that she loved her childminder. Mm. And yet I used to ask her about it later on when she was seven and eight and she couldn't remember it. So she could only remember that she was loved. And maybe that's maybe that's the thing that we should all hold on to. Mm. If you're loved, you know, and taken care of. Yeah, maybe she always felt counts. safe. That's always felt safe. More than a lot of kids, it's unfortunately. More than all loads of kids have. And I've done a lot of work now and met a lot of kids who are care experienced and stay with me and, you know, I support people and 
And she sees that as well, you know, that she had something that was very different. Maybe that's what we should all be aspiring to. Did you move to Strathclyde in part to be near your family? So, yes, I did. And I also wanted it, my, they've only got one grandchild. And I wanted my dad and my mum to have that experience as well. Aside from that, what made you, was there another reason for you moving back up here? Was it the opportunity? Yeah, so I mean, Strathclyde was a big force. Mm. It was, it had a lot of serious crime. It was... Yeah, I mean, it was the uh, quote-unquote crime capital of Europe around that point, wasn't it? It was, you know, it was a different experience entirely. It did a lot of kind of terrorism work. It had, I mean, it just was, it was a big force. Glasgow, I mean, Glasgow, obviously, I'd worked in the, the emergency rooms in Glasgow Oil. Um, when I'd been nursing. So I knew it from that perspective. Is that, I was, because I was thinking about this earlier and I was thinking, how much do you think the fact that you'd worked in A&E, the emergency <laughs> rooms, and and saw that, saw the repercussions of the violence, how much do you think that shaped your approach to it? I think it probably has. I, it probably didn't occur to me at the time, but it definitely did. You know, I, you know, I mean, I do talk, I still quite like a wound. You know, I think that's what we yeah. do. I do love a wound. <laughs> oh, I mean, my God. Like, I mean, in here, on the I mean, dating the first apps, stage, I like, quite like a wound. Quite like a wound, you know. <laughs> I mean, I've got that sort of ex-nurse bit where I, I think, oh, you know, like dressing and, you know, I've got my, lots of my cousins are, are mercy. So I'm very, I still love health. I do, I love health. I love public health. So it did. I mean, it, it I mean, I'd seen a lot of violence coming out of the emergency rooms. You know, it, it just is. That's what that's what nurses see. You know, whether it's through, I mean, you get trauma obviously from you know from collisions and whatever else. And then there's the other, you know, the random violence or the punches and the domestic abuse that comes in. Mm. You know, through your door. You know, people who are trying to tell you something different. So it did. It shaped me and made me a better person about how to approach people and the stories people tell themselves about how injuries happened. Yeah, that's a good point actually, because. The stories they're telling themselves and the stories they're telling you might be the same, but they might not be the truth. Oh, no, they're definitely not the truth. Yeah. Lots of it. And, and it's a skill of great practitioners and, and some spectacular emergency room consultants and, and nurses who get the real story out of people. And in doing that, sometimes it's, you know, you're opening, you're lifting a stone and it's domestic abuse and maybe child abuse and maybe neglect and, you know, it's a great place to try and start to solve, solve people's problems, solve them, with them, because there's a trust element, isn't there? You know, it's not like, it's not the police, it's not social work, it's health. People like health. They'll tell people in health things, mm. they won't tell anybody else, because it almost feels a bit more equal, the relationship, but it's not power. Is it mm. so police have power, social work have power. But sometimes the nurses, I think, are sometimes, mm. you know, a good a good way in. And a good doctor won't exert her power. A yes. good doctor will listen. It's a whole other conversation. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> so yes, I think that's where that's where lots of it came from. It's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. How diverse was Strathclyde Force when you got there? Were there many women? Were there... Oh, God, no. <laughs> I mean, I've got a picture of myself. I've had a, I've got a picture where I think there was around 50 of us on the sort of senior CID. And I think one or two women. I mean, constantly just in rooms with me, you know. And I never really thought anything of it. That's just how it is. Did you feel like you had to, like you said, you had to work twice as hard and 
be twice as good. Did you feel like you had to behave differently, present yourself differently? Yes, I think you do. I think you have to be very resilient. You can't let some of the comments get to you or the undermining, and that probably happened a wee bit later on. I think I've always presented, I like high heels, maybe because I'm short, you know <laughs> I just I admire always, your ability to walk in life. And I don't, you know, I'm proud of being a woman. I I, you know, I don't care really about how they thought I dressed. I've always been very, you know, I will dress to work. I I never capitulated on dressing very androgynously. And that's just me. I'm not saying anybody else that does that. But for me, I quite liked it. It was about me. And I don't know. I just I've always had that bit, and people still say, "Oh, well, I remember you turn up, in, you know, this dress or whatever." Else. And it wasn't about that; it was about me. It's about making me feel like it. It was a, I don't know, was it a mask? Maybe a little bit. Yeah, a bit of armor, maybe. Yeah, a little bit of um, Stanislavski. You know that? Let's get in. You know, let's get yeah. into character. You, you think yourself into yeah. something, and that's the way you present. Because you, I mean, but it might be this might be the point for you to tell us a little bit about the bringing a public health approach yeah. to dealing with violence yeah. and how kind of radical that was at the time. At the time, yeah. So well, uh, still is. Let's still is. I mean, so 2003, <laughs> so we had, so my colleague, who I didn't really know very well, John Carnican and I, so John was deputy head of CID and I was head of intelligence analysis and sort of in locked doors, et cetera, because we dealt with the sort of secret side of it. And there was, we were looking at murder, so we had, United Nations had come out and said that Scotland was the most violent country in Western Europe and Glasgow was the most violent city. And, you know, of course we knew that, you know. I mean, since No Mean City, which was written way back in, I don't know, 1960s, you know, Glasgow's had this, I don't know, a sort of, it's a stereotype of the Glasgow hard man and, mm. and, and violence and murder and gangs. And we had a great detection rate, honestly. 98% detection rate. I mean, we used to say we catch the feckless in the daft. You know, they, <laughs> you know, they leave DNA, they, you know. And so we always had, there was always murders ongoing. And it was that sort of old Strathclyde, you know, we've had another murder. And how did the guys in the gangs respond to you as opposed to your male colleagues? Differently. I mean, I don't know, that's a really interesting, some gravitate towards you because you're female. And it's good, you know, and you have to play your strengths. I can't be everything to all people. Some people got on really well with me, others. It was a good male role model because what was also consistent, not only with things like being excluded from school, was often good male role models. I know what it is to be a woman, but most of the young boys that I met had no idea what it was to be a good man. You know, the skills. Mm -hmm. And how do you learn it? You know, most of the teachers in the schools were women. Uh, that's not a bad thing. It just is. That's what it is. They wouldn't have, some of them didn't have dads. I mean, I've got, I'm a single parent. I was a single parent family. But there was something about, what's my role as a man in society? How do I interact with women? Who tells me? Who shows me? How do, how do I learn? And I think so many of them had no idea how to do that. That's no excuse. But it's just, it was self-evident. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating, isn't it? I mean, I can see now the number of times since we've been sat here and when we were talking before, you've said it's fascinating. It is fascinating. It's catching, I mean, it is. It's catching. I always say to people, see if you're bored doing this, go and take your pulse. You must be dead, you know, yeah. because... <laughs> You should always find something really interesting. And it has to be about curiosity. I'm naturally curious. I am. I love, I mean, I'll take things apart. I mean, you know, if I've got something that's broken at home, I think, oh, I can have a go at this. Not always hugely successfully, but I do quite like thinking, like, I'm curious about things. And I think you should always, it's a thing you should hold on to. When everything else goes, your looks and whatever else, your ability to run and all the things that you quite like doing, you should always hold on to your curiosity about life because it's what keeps you active, keeps your brain active and think, oh, I love that. You know, I do, I, I go out and I see things that happen in local areas and I think, oh, that is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I say to people, tell, tell me something that you want me to be really interested in. 
and people will show you things that I think, oh, you know. So I do, I, I genuinely get excited by it. I think that's so true, what you just said about curiosity, because I think the number of people I speak to, and you can really see that the ones who are going into second half of their lives or, or older with curiosity are the ones who get fired up and interesting, interested and still have young brains, if not young bodies. Absolutely. And, and I hope that's what I hold on to when everything else is gone. I hope that's what I hold on to, that real interest about people and that real interest about how things are working and what you can do differently. I mean, whether that's, you know, nudging people into something, and I use that word because nudges had a good and a bad reputation, but yeah. how do you nudge people into, you know, making better decisions? How do you put something in front of them and support them to make different decisions about their life, but still give them control and agency over their own lives? And so I, I, I don't know, I think I'll never, I'll never not love it. I'll never not love it. How do you think, if at all, has your attitude changed as you've got older? I think maybe it's so iterative you don't realise the change. You know, it's never a, it's never a, a, a great Damascene conversion. I think, oh, I'm just going to do this now. I think it's been iterative and I've learned good and bad. You know, I've still got the scars on the back from things that I've, I think, well, that didn't go that well or whatever else. But it's 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 iterative. I think. I care less now about what people think. I think back to the Scottish and, and Calvinist and female. I think that there's that thing around being a woman that you always think, you know, that sort of hand wringing, you know, grief. What if, what if this goes wrong? And actually, I've never cared if things go wrong. I quite like feeling spectacular. If I'm going to feel, I might as well do it big. <laughs> I mean, that's that's my whole thing. There is no point in just trying to do small things. I think you have to try and do big change now there's lots of iterative bits in that but I don't know maybe that's what it is it's really hard doesn't it when you get to when you get to 58 and you're looking back and you think what has changed somebody came up to me in a Tesco store and said you were at primary school with me I was <laughs> devastated because I thought I must have changed when I was primary school but yeah but people often say to me if I bump into someone that I've known a long time ago you haven't changed at all. It's like, well, clearly I have. Because pop my PS, I'm going grey. But I guess if they're roughly your age, you yeah. still look, they're looking at you with the level eyes, if you know if yeah. that made any sense. Yeah. And I think I quite like speaking to, you know, um, like young, like or the, the young team that you know, are in my family now. And, and I quite like that conversation because they still think, Oh, she's slightly bonkers. I'll go out with her. You know, so yes, I quite like yeah. that, that they still see a little bit of that as opposed to the, the generation that I'm in. Yeah, they'll judge you slightly differently. I mean, they still think, how can you keep going? You know, why are you not tired? Or they think, oh, I think about retirement. I'm like, oh my God, plenty of time for sleeping when you're dead. You know? Yeah. You can't imagine giving it up. Oh no, God, I'm like a shark. If I, if I stop swimming forward, I'll drown. I mean, I, 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 I couldn't. I couldn't, not, not now, I'm still interested. If I, if I ever got to the point that I wasn't interested, I'd, I'd have to leave. So interesting of a second person who said they're like a shark that I've spoken to in the last week. <laughs> exactly, oh. exactly, but exactly the same thing about keeping moving. About momentum. Like, yeah, you know, it has to be momentum. momentum. I mean, if you start to rest on your laurels, if you start to think that you can't make change, then what's the point? Uh, just now you said something about when the rest starts to go, you know, your knees and your looks and everything. Do you worry about that? Do you think about that? No. no. I, the one thing I really want to do, I love hill climbing. It's my thing. Well, we find I you up the trussocks on the weekend. So absolutely, you'll find me up. And I always want to be able to do that. I always want to be able to, I want to be able to go up a hill and just look out. And see it and just find, I don't know, it's a bit I can. I love it, you know, and, and I always want to be able to do that. And I, I would really regret if I couldn't do that. So I try and maintain fitness enough mm. that, I, that I'm able to do that. Knees. Knees, that is a thing, the knees. That's why you should wear high heels because I'm sure it gives you an unstable knee. 
probably, but you've been wearing them so long. You've been wearing heels that high, and I've got to say, what are they, three inches? Oh, they're three inches. I mean, oh, so much respect. I honestly don't think I could even stand in three-inch heels anymore, let alone walk in them. Oh, I don't I don't always walk in them. I do have <laughs> a pair of trainers. <laughs> Thank God. Like, yeah, I know I don't. I, I really just do it just to, to be a bit taller and... I, I don't know. And just for me, and it's trite, I know it is, but I like no, them and it gives me confidence. Not. Yeah, I don't think it's trite. I think, I mean, in a completely different, much shallower context, I mean, I think my era of wearing really, really high heels was when I was editing glossy magazines mm -hmm. and having to go to fashion shows and stuff. And I think it was about that. It was about armour. It was about a certain posture that they give you. Yeah, absolutely. Your shoulders back, head up you know and you know onwards and I I used to say that when I when I was going out of rooms and sometimes like well lots of guys or even jails you know into prisons I always put my shoulders back I look people in the eye you know and you, you try to take control of a situation you know or or depending on what it is but that you're not less in their eyes because sometimes they'll have been in domestically violent situations that we don't think about women in that way. So I don't know, it is, it's a bit of armour. When Nicola Sturgeon came on the podcast, she we were talking about menopause and she said that she had felt very conscious that in the environment that she worked in, that could be, this is me putting words onto her, but to paraphrase, that it could be kind of weaponised against her, being a woman in a you know, mm -hmm. that environment. Did you ever, have you ever thought about that? Did you ever feel like that with menopause? Where are you at with that? I was slightly that? terrified of it, thinking about it. I don't know why, isn't that daft? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I've got like all this health, you know, I'm surrounded by nurses and whatever else. And yeah, I mean, it's an inevitability, isn't it? But actually, no, I'm, I was very good at getting information. I never thought about it. But I suppose I you mean, are Mrs. Intelligence Gatherer, aren't you? So. Well, absolutely. And we talk about it in here. I mean, 80% of my staff are women. So we talk about it constantly, you know. And I will recommend people to go. I mean, I'll say, you have to do what works for you. Say HRT, absolutely go into Louise Newsom's site. I think it's absolutely amazing. Educate yourself, you know, work out what works for you. And then, you know, and we all bend around you. You know, if you're having a terrible day, we'll bend around you. And actually, I keep them on to my team. I mean, because I treat them like adults, you know, I'm not really interested how they do the work. They know what they've got to do. It's got to be of a high standard. But also, they know that they get a bit of flex, so they work harder. For, that's going to seem terrible, isn't it? I'm going to sound like, but they work no, harder for you because they know that there's an understanding here. I, and it's a personal thing, I was really conscious when, you know, there's, carers in here, women who are, who are caring for, for kids and men, you know, but who are also caring for older people. I think because I've been through that, I'm really, you know, look, your kids come first. Kids come first. Your kids ill, I don't want you to think twice. I want you to be your child if that's where you need to be. And we'll, we'll work around it. And I think I have to set that tone because I never want anybody to feel like I did, you know, guilty. I think I need to go, you know. And plus, I like a baby, so we're always bringing babies. Yeah. Here, so I, I quite like it. We've got three cooking at the moment, so you know, I look forward to that. You know, I, I think that's a nice thing. So, what did you? What worked for you, menopause wise? HRT. I mean, it just it, and I never had any other symptoms bar joint pain. But you know, when I talked about, and it was the only thing I had. But I have to say that my experience of going to the GP, and sadly during COVID. I was pretty poor mm -hmm. and I'm really knowledgeable about menopause now. I'm knowledgeable about the drugs. I, you know, I, originally I'd been prescribed norethisterone, which is one of the, the hormones that's in it, and it was terrible. And I remember going back and, and GP was saying to me, you know, you have to go in for longer. I couldn't sleep. I felt really anxious, etc. I said, no, I'm so going to... So it made your symptoms worse. Well, so it made my symptoms worse. And he said, I'm going to prescribe you a sleeping tablet. He said, well, how about an antidepressant? I said, dog. I said, look. I said, you prescribe me a drug. And it's me. I said, so now you are just, you know, it's just polypharmacology. Yeah. So you're now going to give me the sleeping tablets. And, now you, and then you want me to give take... Give drugs I, to I, deal with the drug you prescribe. You want me to take an SSRI? I said, No. And I'm not doing it. But I wonder, had I not been so knowledgeable 
and got quite a medical background and still very involved in it, that women and I were just capitulated. So I said, no, I want to change. And I changed to something else. And he gave me no office. And I was like, no, it's not that. I know what it is. We don't listen to women enough who know their bodies. I think mm-hmm. women are so in tune with their bodies, they generally know when things are wrong. And we don't listen to them. Or we other them. And, you know, it's constantly, there's a, a journalist here, um, Marion Scott, who was talking about mesh, and vaginal yes, mesh that was used. Yes. And the women who were going back to say that they had all these terrible symptoms were just negated. Mm-hmm. We need to have our voices heard more and listened to more around menopause and I think it's not until you really think about how it affects you that you suddenly think god actually my life has changed you're alive for a long time now we don't die at 40 you're going to be alive for a long time you're going to be working for a long time I mean this next generation you might be working until you're 70 yeah so you might as well be in as good as fit as you can yeah you know get good advice go on your menopause sites educate yourself about it so that you still feel that you've got lots to contribute, that you bounce out of bed, or at least, you know, don't groan when you're trying to put on your socks. Yeah. And that you get a good quality sleep because you need good sleep. If, you know, there's a good reason they use sleep deprivation as torture, you know, exactly. is because yeah. when you're sleep deprived, and, you know, people, women who go into the menopause, I mean, I speak to women and hear about it, it's a terrible thing. So I'm always saying, go to Louise Newsom, go and have a look at the site, you know, Go in and with a, a, a sort of saying to your GP what it, the symptoms that you've got and perhaps even what you think you need. Can't hurt, can it? But well, you've got to take control. And GPs also. There are some phenomenal GPs now. I, I, I bloody love some of the GPs that I work with. But others, you need to up your game a bit. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember that, the, again, the clue is in the name and it's G, GP is a general practitioner. Yeah. They're not experts and, you know, many different docs I've spoken to and the women I've spoken to about their experience with NHS doctors have said, you know, until, I mean, I don't know if they're trained now, but they were not trained in menopause and they can't know everything. So they shouldn't pretend. They can. And, you know, and there's such a difference. So, for example, you can be prescribed testosterone cream in England, but not up here. So yes, some areas don't yeah. have that. So there are different prescribing practices. And yet we know that testosterone is one of the things that can really help some women. No, not yeah. all. But it would be quite nice to have that available for women who want it. Yeah. And, you know, so I just think there needs to be a, I suppose, a, a, a fairer, you know, a fairer playing field for, for women. Yeah. And to be able to go back and say, this one doesn't suit me. And, I mean, I went through four different ones, you know, Patchy's terrible for me, you yeah. know. But eventually I found some, you know, something I like. Yeah, I and think my GP recently said yeah. to me, Or oh, do you think you should come off this? And I said, You're not going to get this off me until I'm clothed in pain. You know, yeah. I, you know, he's <laughs> trying to have the conversation about do you still need it and such like, but I, I need to feel physically and mentally acute. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the other thing, isn't it? That you know, it's only recently been talked about is the impact on your thinking. Yeah. I mean, it's, brain fog is a very cuddly way of putting it, really. Yeah, and I've got to be, I mean, I've got to be on point. I, I, can't have yeah. an, I can't have an off day. You know, if I'm going to Parliament or if I'm going to prison or if I'm going to somebody's house, I need to be on point. I, can, I hate feeling tired. I mean, it's one of these things, I mean, maybe in the next reincarnation I'll be a sleuth, but I need to have decent sleep. It's one of the, it's my foundation. And then after that, you know, it'll be fine. It's brilliant. I'm going to ask you the questions I always ask now. Okay. What's your emotional age? About 35, I think. Why 35? I've done all the trials and tribulations that you do in your 20s, and I've just felt I knew who I was. I knew who I was. And I knew I couldn't be bent into somebody else's shape. 35 is not a bad age to reach that realisation. Now, some people are still finding it out in the yeah, 50s and 60s. Say, it's taking some of us a bit longer. I know you I know you love a book. Well, give us a book recommendation. Do you know this is the hardest thing because it changes all the time. Whatever I read, I just find something different on it. And do you read crime? Never. Bit of a busman's holiday. Never. I do <laughs> I do listen to stuff. I mean, 
it's going to sound really sad. I love Terry Pratchett books. I just so find that they are, I, but I just love that. I love a wee bit of escapism. I have just got myself in the Audible, um, you know, I love the mythos, like Stephen Fry. I yeah. like that sort of thing. So it's really difficult. And people give me books all the time. We have books here that people bring in and, you know, some of it's crime books and I just don't read it. But I, I do, I, I've loved just re- reading recently about the Magdalene Laundries, The Othering mm. of Women. Okay. And yeah. The Fallen Women. Stories mm. old as time. What advice would you give younger women? Feel bad, move on. Such a great bit of advice. Yes. There is nothing to be gained by sitting, wringing your hands and clutching your pearls over things that have happened or done. The only thing you can change is the future. And, you know, as I said, too much time spent in guilt. Once you get over it and realise that that's just a part of it, it'll all be gravy. Who is your old bird role model? Oh, well, that's an easy one. Mary Hepburn. Um, Mary Hepburn is a gynaecologist and obstetrician. Oh, Mary, I mean, she'll kill me for doing this now because she must be, she must be late seventies. So she went to Edinburgh University in nineteen seventy-three, came from Shetland, and started in Rotten Row in Glasgow, the first clinic for women who were HIV positive or drug addicted. Wow. Who were just, I mean, they were, the way that they were treated was terrible. People that didn't want to see them. And she started up this clinic and was, and set a standard for women who were coming in that was equal and indeed better because they needed more care. The most traumatised, neglected and othered women who are having kids and who love their babies, you know, and I know that people want to make value judgments about them but love their kids. And she took care of them and she gave them expert care. And in fact, I've got a poster up here because I brought her to speak to everybody about what a real change maker looks like because they started these clinics all over hospitals. And she's as great now as she was then. An utter uber mensch. Terrifying. I mean, she is terrifying. But what a woman. What a woman. When did you first encounter her? Oh, ages and ages ago. Must be, must be about 17 years ago. And I met her at an event and I heard her speaking and she just talked about women and around the services they got in health. And she's just pretty phenomenal. And her mum, who was, I don't know, was a linguist. And I think I get the feeling, although I might be wrong, was part of the code breaking um, down at Bletchley Park. So a pretty extraordinary sort of, family from Shetland, you know, she's yeah. a really lovely lilt. And don't mistake the lovely lilt for, for yeah. someone that has not got skin as thick as a rhino and is utterly single-minded. And I absolutely love her. And then she, we were both up for Scots Women of the Year. And I was I actually voted for her because I think that she was just so deserving. She sounds fantastic. She is absolutely, she'd interview her because she's amazing. Is she back in Shetland? No, no, she's in Glasgow. You know what? I think I will. Oh, you will. She's been all over the world, you know, trailing people around midwifery and about, you know, obs and gynae, but fistulas and just about taking care of women. She sounds amazing. She is. Uh, what's your superpower? I don't know why I always have to look these questions up. I ask what's them every superpower? single time. So if I asked my daughter, she would say it's been able to convince her to walk up a hill that she doesn't want to walk up <laughs> and believe in me when I say it's only going to be two hours, but she actually knows it's going to be fun. <laughs> but I suppose if you spoke to others, I'm pretty good at speaking to people. I still like people, you know. I don't know if that's a superpower, but it's it it's one of my, this is going to sound terrible, one of, one of the guys that I work in, in drugs, and out of a lot of the problem, he said, Can you could speak to anybody from the White House to the Shite House. <laughs> I don't like the terminology, but I think it's it's useful. Yeah, it really is. I think it's definitely a superpower. Uh, last one, how many fucks do you give? Do you know what I'd like to say zero? But there are things that I still think. I still must be shaped by the society that I'm in because I still conform to certain things. I'm a realist. I'd like to say I give no fucks because I really generally, I don't, and in my work life, I don't. 
but there's other things that I think that obviously I'm still shaped and you should always be aware of that. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, you might also like my conversations with Nicola Sturgeon and Val McDermott. You can hear a new episode of The Shift each Tuesday, wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, please do rate, review and follow because it really does help other people find us. And if you'd like more of The Shift in your life, head over to theshiftwithsambaker.substack.com and sign up for weekly newsletters, podcast extras and more.